Okay, so we're on to our second speakers, plural. So we've broken the rules here and uh, not that there were rules, but instead of having two individual speakers, we've got Erica and then we've got Anna and Claire as a dynamic duo together. And so Anna and Claire have joined the Pro Elephant Rider program a few months ago and are going through the ECD certified consultant training. And Anna, I think you became an elephant rider in May in 2020. So quite early on, does that sound about does that sound about right? Yeah, and then Claire later in the year in December. So I'm assuming Anna, you raved about it, and Claire was like, "I need to get in on this as well." Oh, and she likes to follow my lead, Jeremy. Don't you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Anna and Claire uh, work at Good Start. You've seen the profile, and I invited them both to share together because they're going through the program together. And I've been blown away by the work they're doing in the space of early child um, care and helping the people who care for um, small people as well. And so I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your, uh, your stories. So Anna and Claire, the meetup is yours. Awesome. I'm still fangirling over Erica, if I'm really honest. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I really enjoyed it, Erica. I'm still fangirling over here. So, um, all right, I will share my screen clear because we both know that's uh, a strength of mine and not of yours in recent, <laughs> uh, in recent workshops we've done. <laughs> oh, if anyone wanted to know, Claire and I have high banter levels. So um, very high. Yeah. All <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> oh, bear with me. I'll make sure I've got the sound on there as well, Claire. Um, okie dokie. So Claire, I'm going to throw it to you for to yeah. kick it off. All right, thanks, Anna. So yes, Anna and myself have been using the Emotional Culture Deck um, with Good Start Early Learning. Um, and if you don't know a little bit about Good Start, we are for children, not for profit, and we are the Australia's largest provider of early learning and care. Um, and quite different, we are we're known as a social enterprise, so we're not a charity, but what we are is we exist to improve uh, lives of children and families, but at the same time, it's important for us to make a profit to be able to keep investing um, with the absolute attention to inclusion of all children. Um, so that's a, a really big remit of ours. But just to get you a little bit of a feel for who we are, we're just going to show you a very short video, which is our recent uh, TV advert uh, that we have here in Good Stuff. In, uh, Australia. Every day we're reminded of what we're truly for. We're for not letting anything stop early learning. Because we're good start. We're for always being there and being at our best. We're for staying close and connected with our centre families. We're for helping them understand the world around them. We're good start. We're not for profit so we can do more for children. And so just to give a bit of a, a, a feeling for the size of that we have, our footprint, as you can see in Australia, is quite large. Uh, we do have currently 664 centres. We support 67, 670 children. Um, we're alongside 56,800 families. And that relationship between children and families is integral to the way that we work together. And our good starters, our people team, we've got over 15,000. And you can see a bit of an idea of the split across the organisation. Queensland it is an, uh, um, a Queensland-based organisation and it has got the biggest footprint there. But you can see there's also some real size uh, in our other states as well. Um, and that one, who we've worked with. Um, so we've been having a play with uh, centre teams around our emotional culture deck. We've also been rather playful with our Good Start leadership team, who are our senior leaders in the organisation, and also our centre support teams. And I think one of the things that we've really worked on is that we talk very much about being playful with children and that's how they learn and actually using the emotional culture deck as a way for being playful to talk about emotions. If it's okay to talk with children about emotions, enabling them to label emotions, it's important that we also do it as adults. I'm going to throw this back to Anna. Yeah, so uh, we thought we'd actually just talk through two uh, examples of how we've used the ECD um, and, and, and share from that. So the first one we're going to share of how we've used it with one uh, centre team. So we've worked with a team in Everston Park in South Australia. Um, and if you're not familiar with South Australia or the particular area of Evanston Park, Evanston Park is in a very low socioeconomic area. So um, 
we do ha ensure a lot of our centres are actually positioned in those low socioeconomic areas. So we can actually best support the children based in that area who are often experiencing maybe high levels of trauma come from um, different family backgrounds. Um, and so they have the, the best start of life uh, alongside obviously all, all kids in Australia. So um, Emerson Park, low socioeconomic area, and we have as an organisation, a load of tools to support our educators with supporting those children from those backgrounds. We don't actually, if we historically look at our portfolio, have the same amount of tools to support the educators because the people that are in this centre, working in this centre and other uh, low socioeconomic centres are coming from the same background as well. So we need to actually sometimes pivot and, and work differently with the teams that maybe need a bit, a bit more support. Um, and I had um, the centre director from this centre reached out to me, um, and this is a while ago, but, you know, really aware that her team needed um, more support. And, and in her words, her ideal goal was to create a really safe space. So when their team members came to work, they could leave their home life at the door, but actually come into a safe space. And, and when I went on to work with this team, that made more sense. You know, we had, um, you know, educators coming in that were in um, abusive relationships. We had educators coming in and their partners were, um, some partners were in jail, some partners were um, actually had serious diseases. So it, 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 there was a lot going on uh, in, in this team. And she wanted to create this really safe sanctuary space for her team as for her, the children in the centre as well. Um, so really obviously wanted to work on, on how they felt uh, coming into work. So it was, it was kind of a fantastic opportunity um, to, to work with the ECD and, and with this centre. So how we went about it is um, over the space of uh, three evening team meetings, um, we mapped out how the team want to feel at work. So first off, obviously looking at their desired feelings, and then understanding their undesired feelings as well. Um, and so we, we did this um, obviously work uh, with the team. I always made sure after every um, workshop we did with them, I created a visual for these guys to work with, you know, because it's not a virtual space. Our centres aren't virtual spaces. Everyone is physically there. And so the use of these kind of um, tools is still very much needed in, in our centres um, as it's a face-to-face -face environment and very tactile. So we decided that the team def, uh, defined how they want to feel and how they will not want to feel and then obviously went on to make um, commitments uh, to each other. But the gold didn't happen in these sessions. I mean, there was a lot of, it was very raw. Um, I was quite taken aback by how the process and the emotions that were coming to the surface from the team and, and the, the bonding that happened in these sessions. But the goal didn't happen in the workshop itself. It's actually what happened outside. And to support the centre director, I had with the centre director, uh, first off it was fortnight, then moved to monthly one-to-ones, um, coaching sessions with her to support her, how she will carry this work forward because she is, she's got the feet on the ground. I was going to help her to facilitate, but she was going to have to create the momentum and, and, and make it stick, essentially. Um, so... We, we had those one-to-ones and I'll show you something that was quite uh, awesome that came out of these. Um, uh, on the right side of the page there, you'll see um, you've got the, the tracking canvas for the emotions, but how this team decided to use their emo the defined uh, desired emotions was fantastic the centre director decided to make them KPIs. So when she gave to her leadership team um, particular projects, oh my God, my head's gonna die, particular projects that um, uh, for them to deliver, rather than just having um, kind of key KPIs met, what um, she said is that actually the team have to feel these desired uh, emotions over the course of you launching this project. So the assistant director had to launch key educator relationships, um, and throughout that, she had to continually check in with the team on how they were feeling through the course of the program and launching and, and using this new tool. Um, so she used it as, as, a, um, as a KPI, which was an awesome way to actually really stay true and focused on how people feel, not just what they're doing. Um, so they did that. And then also um, throughout the course, 
um, I encourage the centre director to continually use me almost like a, a journal point. So pop me an email when you've had a win, when you've had a um, something happen in your centre that that's you see that kind of room for improvement. And these were just some, I've just taken some of the uh, emails um, that she sent me just to, to show actually where the move on, not just with the whole team, but with some individuals uh, that she was working with. One of the really big um, wins from, from this and knock-on effects um, was that this team had high um, incident and safety, uh, safety incident rates in the centre. So, um, and the, the reason where that was coming from is because there wasn't the relationships across the rooms. People were just focused on their own rooms. Um, and the biggest knock-on effect that she was uh, really proud of was actually the reduction of safety incidents happening in her centre because there was more helping behaviours across the rooms and across her team um, because they wanted to deliver those feelings. So the fact that actually focusing on feelings and emotions actually improved the safety of this centre uh, was a huge win. And they went on to win a national award for um, safety within their centre. And she accredited the work with the ECD as one of um, the points there. So that's, and that's huge to have to win a safety award, uh, a, a goodie we call them, um, out of the, the whole network was a huge achievement for us. I was, I'm still so proud of Christian and her work there. So that's um, a little bit of an insight of how we've worked with a centre team. And now I'm going to throw back over to Claire um, to share how we've worked with the centre support team, but um, our own team, the learning team. Thanks, Anna. So yeah, our learning team, we've just got a bit of a snapshot here. It is not a normal day. It was our Christmas get together um, and, and actually, all virtual so a lot of our experiences over this team have been virtual we haven't seen I haven't seen Anna in two years um, as many of us have been working in this well how did we bring this to life so we introduced this recently to the learning team to get them a real sense of um, as we've restructured and how we might come together so in that space what we've been doing is introduced the emotional culture deck and been playful with them um, around each of the sessions so if you want to move forward Anna for me Again, what we've done with them is created that virtual um, canvas for them to work with and what emotions were coming up for them. And if you can imagine it, we, we brought together under one umbrella, our regional uh, RTO, um, our learning team, um, and also the team that was also uh, looking after our learning hub. So they were all siloed and we wanted to bring everybody together in this one space. Um, really different personalities, backgrounds and experiences. So how did we have a shared language around emotion was important. So working through the deck, we've now at the space where we've got uh, the uh, emotions have been uh, called to. And I think one of the biggest things for us was when we were in one of the sessions that one of the team were like, oh, why do we need to talk about emotions? We just need to get the job done. So it's very much about the task. Um, but now the way she actually talks about her emotions quite freely and really being able to allow others to connect with her and have that safe space as a team has been really, really um, awesome to have and move forward with. The other aspect, uh, and if you want to move just forward this slide again, um, and I'm going to throw back to Anna to touch this one because of the fact of what we did start to notice with the team when we came to those emotions. Yeah, so after that first session of defining our emotional culture, um, we threw it over to the team. What do you want to do next? Where do you want to go? Um, and Claire and I were ready. We had all the tools. We had the canvas. We had everything ready to go. Just going, where, where do you want to go next? We threw uh, control over to the group to decide where to go. And the group said, oh, we want to create an it's okay to list. So, you know, so, what do we have permission to do? Because I think there was a real desire to make the you know, the, the, the unexplicit, explicit, you know, really understand what can we do? Because I think we were still um, in this way of virtual working that we still wanted to know what, what's, what's okay. Um, so then we, we jumped into a session and we go, okay, so to, to feel our five desired feelings, what is it okay to do? And we ran this session, this was a, another hour session. But at the end of the session, when Claire and I were reviewing the, what the team put forward, we were kind of going, oh, we didn't feel that that was a real, it's okay to list. Because some of the points put on that list were like, well, that's an essential. You need to do that every day. It's not okay to do it. You have to do it. So we then, um, we had then in the interim had a one-to-one -one with Jeremy. It's very well-timed. Um, and then we went back to the group. 
and we refrain, we restructured the activity. So essentially we had all the notes from the previous one and we said, okay, um, with all your notes you've created, we want you to drag them to one of three columns. We need to. So these are necessary to fill our desired behaviours. We have to do them on a regular basis. They might require conscious thought or practice to deliver. They are absolutely non-negotiables. Or do you want to drag your comments to um, we should? They're kind of, they go, these are good behaviours that will improve the quality of our team. We may naturally already be doing these or they may, may be easy to do. Or is it, does it sit in the third box of, We've got permission to. So these are things we've got permission to do as and when needed to feel our desired feelings. These are not done all the time, but can be done in our own individual discretion and have the full understanding and support of the team. So we briefed them again and they went back to all of their post-it notes or virtual post-it notes they did and dragged them around and, and repositioned them. And we ended up with, um, they've only got four here, but five um, you know, slides to actually show to feel supported, we need to do this, but it's okay to do this. To feel courageous, we need to do this, but it's okay to do this. Um, so we only did this work, um, not last week, the week before. So we're gonna pull them into a much prettier visual for the team to, to share back. But these are gonna be our, our kind of guardrails of behaviors really of, of what we need to be doing and it's okay to be doing in order to feel our desired um, behavior. So it's the first time we did this kind of activity as well. Claire and I are big at playing. Um, so we do it in every aspect of our work. So we don't mind jumping in and trying something that's a bit rough and ready. We'll give it a go and then we'll refine it. Um, but what I really loved, and I shared this with the breakout room just before, is that I was a bit hesitant going back to do the same activity because I thought maybe the group would be a bit, oh, we've done this already, I'm busy, let's move on. But the response from the group was fantastic. They really appreciated that this wasn't this work isn't being rushed over and they enjoyed it uh, i remember the comments after the session claire it was just um that a lot of people just absolutely loved nailing what is okay and what what should be done and getting everyone on the same page um and then from that point i'll throw it back over to you claire yeah the the other bit that we've integrated this with is is our team culture canvas as a new team coming together we wanted to really define uh what are the aspects and we've uh, drawn on gustaf rossetti's work of the fearless culture and the team culture canvas but there was one bit was like well how do we connect the emotional culture deck and not see this as something separate to but actually integral part of our team culture um, and so we've actually adjusted it and been playful and said, actually, one component and it is really about our rituals is connecting to emotions. And so in the canvas, we have your mindsets, your emotions and your behaviours. We've actually drawn this in as part of our team culture, uh, an integral component. And we're working through the team now in terms of all the different pieces. So you'll because there's quite a lot of empty uh, ones. We've only done the middle column and the emotional culture deck uh, aspects so far. We reconvene uh, in, in the next couple of weeks to complete it. But what we've also found is that the work that we've done in terms of we, we must has now becomes our norms and rules. So there's a really lovely synergy for us about being able to see that in the emotional culture is absolutely integral to our team culture. So um, it's been really interesting to work with the team and being able to actually capitalize on that initial work with the emotional culture deck. Yeah, um, so, and, and once again, we're playing around with it and embedding the ECD more into this canvas. And so those, the work of those first two workshops has populated two of those boxes uh, already. So um, yeah. Um, right, so moving on, so to look at, you know, how did we get buy-in um, into using the ECD? And this was, I think, I, I don't know, compared to Erica, it feels like a little bit more of a slower burn for us. I don't know. But we kind of went, we did bottom up, then we did top down. So we 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 worked with some uh, specific teams. So we worked with some centre teams. Then we get in, got into the kind of centre support teams. We worked with the people team. Um, and we got some wins, uh, you know, on the board. And then we got the interest, I think, from the Good Start leadership team at that point. And so then we've worked with our, our leaders and, and board members in that sense and working with defining how they want to feel. So far, our work, though, has been very much about how the teams want to feel. We haven't yet done that work of, well, how do we want our people to feel? Um, because we really want to actually get everyone kind of almost putting their own life mask on, oxygen mask on first. Um, also, we threw all our effort into making it land, as I said, with one team. So evaluate, promote and showcase. So 
you know, I, I agree with what Erica said, just get in and do it, but put your whole self in with maybe if you've not actually started, but with your, put your whole self in with that one team or couple of teams you're doing it with really partner with them because it's, you're going to learn so much through that process, but you're going to be able to use it to showcase what this tool does as well. Um, and also be consistent. Claire and I, feelings are our jam. So in every team meeting, in every project working group, we will bring that flavour of conversation of, okay, so how is that going to make people feel or how do we want them to feel? We're not um, explicitly linking it to the ECD in that very moment, but because we're talking about the feeling piece, it's going to, it makes it easier to then integrate that work into key projects uh, and so forth onwards. So be known as the person that in those team meetings or in those project working groups to really focus on how people are feeling and then it will become your jam and people will then come to you. So it's easier. Um, so anything to add, Claire? No, absolutely. Get, keep going. Okay. So here we go. So what have we, what we've learned, this is a bit of a personal uh, learn, but I love how we've uh, applied it. Um, and it, and, and it came back to St. Clair said about how we, we had a, 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 someone that was a bit opposed. And, and often I think we walk into this work and people, and we kind of say there are thinkers and there are feelers. And we kind of put people in two buckets. Well, we don't, because I think we went through a bit of a journey here, Claire. There's no such thing as thinkers and feelers. There are no two buckets. We, uh, we're actually on the same continuum here. Um, we see a situation, everyone sees a situation that drives a thought. The thought drives how we feel. It drives our feelings. And then that drives our behaviour. And we come back to this, um, this model, this, this pitch here. To, to if, we, if anyone comes to us, go, oh, no, can we talk about how we think? Well, our thoughts drive how we feel. You know, if people want to talk about changing behaviour in a team or uh, in the culture, we come back here. Um, you know, if, if someone has seen a situation and made an interpretation that's driven a feeling, we, we kind of go down this route. And I think it's really important to position our feelings alongside the thoughts and, and our behaviours. But um, we've, when we're challenged, I'd say, Claire, you know, we use, we kind of come back to this in our, in our mind and we can help that person see how feelings are not separated from thoughts. Thoughts influence our feelings um, and influence our behaviour. So we kind of come back here and use this as a bit of a way to, to coach an individual through or a team through to, to see the importance of actually defining our feelings because um, that will also impact our thoughts and so forth. Our top tips, um, make it easier uh, for them to lead the work. Um, you know, use time between the workshops. This is where the magic happens. Um, I, we spend more time focusing on this space in between a workshop than we do the workshop itself, I would say, Claire, because the, the boots, the, we're not the boots on the ground with the teams, the lead, the team leader is. Um, so how can we support that leader in making this a success? Do we do one-to-ones with them in the interim? What are we getting the team to do between the, the workshops um, that we've got planned out for them? I mean, as, a, as an example, for every workshop we facilitate when they define their feelings we then uh in the in the week or two weeks that separates to the next workshop we give we separate those feelings out put them in pairs and go right give us context define what does that feeling mean to you as a team when they send it back to us that's how we create that pretty poster that we then give them so they do that work um between it and it keeps them um warm or simmering on the topic it's not something that kind of is dropped and then picked up straight again in the next workshop um, look at how you can bring emotions into your existing programs of work. So Claire and I have now been revisiting a lot of our other leadership programs and so forth and actually looking, well, how do we bring this into the, that work? So we are, we are bringing those um, uh, um, emotional temperature checks in at the start of every workshop. When we're designing a program, Claire and I um, up front decide and you know how do we want our learners to feel over this and make sure we're hitting on it and it's even brought into our evaluation and our surveys as well of how did this make you feel so we can really um, compare um, and this is a, a good one don't have a set plan of where to go next um, I love we love going into a session we define the emotions and desired uh, feelings but then we go, right, well, where do you want to go next? What do you want to do? Because every team is going to say something different. 
have all of your tools ready. We use a mentee to do the survey with the team um, and then go with them, go where they want to, where that where needs most focus. Um, it, it is a bit like nervy, I think being on the end of the facilitator because you're like, oh, where are they going to go? But it's quite fun because you're obviously going where they need to go. So don't always have a set plan. Um, and that is it. And I have no idea about timing, Jeremy. So <laughs> uh. <laughs> it, it did not matter. It was. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It did not matter. That, wow. Uh, I've been obviously working with you both for the last couple of months at a one-to-one -one level. And there's some stuff in there that I didn't know that has blown my mind. So I hope everybody else's mind is fizzing there. I've got a new saying as well. Make feelings your jam. <laughs> Make feelings your jam. I think we should all adopt that at some level. That's spectacular. I'm not sure if that's an Aussie thing or a British thing, Claire. But, but <laughs> we'll go with both. <laughs> a Best hybrid of, of that. Uh, I hadn't known about, well, I love your little poster there. Although I'm on a crusade against posters. I love those posters because they're beautifully designed. But the emotional culture commitment, that is a really beautiful thought. A really, really, really beautiful thought. So thank you for sharing that. My, my mind blown. Uh, I love that you are using it or your teams are using it when you're going through the launch of a new program and using them as KPIs. That's really special, I think. So bringing leaders together together to say, if we're launching this new program, what are the what are the emotion KPIs we want people to feel like that? That's stunning. That's really, really stunning. And the last two things I've taken from that, like the don't have a set plan piece, that might scare the bejesus out of people when you hear that, maybe. It, it's certainly my anxiety raises a little bit, but I think there's such a great rule. There's such a great rule in that. Because the more you practice this game, like you both have been practicing your craft of this game a lot. So you're building the confidence to not have a set plan, but it allows you to do that thing, which is giving teams the autonomy to pick where they want to go next. And that is the holy grail. If you can get teams to go, yeah, I think we should be doing this next, then they're a thousand times more likely to buy into it. Yeah. So having the confidence and the bravery and the courage to go, yeah, you guys decide where we go next. Like that is just, that's stunning. And it comes off in your playfulness and trying new things. So I think amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely amazing.